Technology is all around us, and every piece of technology we use is decidedly digital in nature. But here's the deal. The devices themselves may be digital, but they may have to eventually either transmit or receive information among each other. And, well, those transmission media remain analog. So the question is, how do we push digital information along an analog medium? After all, devices have to communicate using physical media, be it a wire, be it radio frequency, or in certain other cases, even light and sound. So of course, the question is, how do we actually manipulate this analog medium to carry out digital information? That's what we're going to be investigating on today's Random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another Random Wednesday episode. Today's video is actually inspired by a comment from a YouTube user called LinkVo, so thank you very much for your suggestion. This is a pretty interesting topic and I'm very glad to be reminded of it because, well, now I get to make this video. Throughout this episode, I'm going to be making references to sine waves. And so if you're not very familiar with, you know, the basic idea of a sine wave, if you're not very familiar with its properties, namely amplitude, frequency, and phase, you might want to check out last week's video, in which I delved quite in depth into what a sine wave actually is. The reason why we're going to be using waves, in particular the sine wave, is because it tends to be a pretty good model for analog transmission media. So it's going to be, well, quite appropriate for today. Today, we're going to be taking a look at four different methods of encoding digital information over an analog medium. And all four of these techniques share one thing in common, and that is they make use of the concept of keying. You see, the whole concept behind keying is that we want to make use of certain preset and known analog states to represent discrete digital values. This might not be extremely clear at this point, but it will become more clear as we talk about the four different techniques. So yeah, in fact, this serves as quite enough of a preamble Let's actually jump in to take a look at the first of four methods. Let's begin looking at keying techniques by starting with the simplest one of all. Now, the easiest way to actually use a sine wave to represent two different states is to simply switch it on or off. In this particular example, when a wave is absent, well, that represents a zero. And when it is present, it represents a one. It doesn't get easier than this, if we have a stream of sound that is constantly going on and off, well, that actually can represent a stream of zeros and ones. This extremely simple scheme also has another name, and that is on-off keying. Well, that's a pretty self-explanatory name, it's just switching things on and off. Of course, that is not the only way to do things. There are many ways you can actually change up amplitude shift keying, and these variants can be used to improve the technique in different ways. Now, one example is to use a low amplitude instead of, you know, completely no signal to represent the low state. This makes the transmission slightly more robust to noise. Since of course, when there is noise, well, you're not gonna get an amplitude of exactly zero. You're gonna get a little bit of noise here and there, and that could be misinterpreted. Having a low amplitude can also help us identify the difference between, you know, a low signal versus a completely lost signal. Another variant is to actually use more than two different levels of amplitude to represent multiple bits at once. Since we have four distinct states, then we can actually transmit two bits at a time. You can of course keep piling on the complexity, and one slightly more complex version of amplitude shift keying is none other than Morse code. Now, Morse code has more than two distinct states, there are actually three of them, long sounds, short sounds, as well as breaks. So actually this goes a little bit beyond shifting amplitude for the purposes of keying, we're also changing the duration of individual sounds. In terms of the advantages and disadvantages of this technique, well, it is extremely simple to understand and implement. All we have to look at is the intensity, be it the loudness or the brightness of a signal. Of course, because of its simplicity, that makes it quite prone to noise, as well as other uncertainties, which, as mentioned earlier, 
can include the distinction between a loss of signal versus a low state. The next technique is called phase shift keying, and this is when information is actually encoded in the face of the wave. What this means of course is, unlike the previous example, well, no matter what bit you're trying to represent, the wave is at its full amplitude. The only difference is that, well, in this particular case, an inversion of the wave represents a 1, whereas, well, the original wave represents a 0. One challenge of doing phase shift keying is that you will need to have a reference signal so that you know how out of phase the signal you are receiving actually is. This of course can be quite expensive, since you essentially have to be transmitting two things at once. And that is why we can use a slightly different coding scheme to work around this problem. And that is instead of looking at the phase relative to a known reference, we just look at the wave from the previous time frame. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking at changes in the phase instead of the absolute phase. In this particular example, you'll notice that say in this frame, there has been no change from the previous frame. In this one, well, there has been a change. So on and so forth. And this can be interpreted to represent 0 or 1. In this particular scheme, having the phase change represents a 1. When a phase doesn't change, it represents a 0. So in this particular case, the absolute phase actually doesn't tell us very much. We will have to actually compare the changes to tell what the information actually is. This has a name, this is called differential phase shift keying, and well, its short form is DPSK not to be confused with certain boy bands. Of course, just like amplitude shift keying, variants exist, including actually using multiple different phases to represent more bit combinations. Now, one cool way to actually represent this information is in what is known as a constellation diagram. Now, this is actually just a simple graph, you know, the math kind of graph, not the computer science kind of graph, and yeah, basically, this graph isn't really read in the XY kind of Cartesian coordinate space. Instead, we take more of a polar coordinate approach to this. That is of course the positive X direction representing 0 degrees. 90 degrees is when we actually rotate it so it points upwards. And yeah, so on and so forth. So, the reason why we do this is to actually, well, use this graph to represent the different phases. Now, in this case, this is the simplest form of PSK, and the two states are, of course, 0 degrees, which is right here, and 180 degrees, which is here. So when we draw it out on this graph like this, we can easily see the distinct states. Of course, for the sake of consistency, these two points are actually on the same circle. Now, don't worry too much about that at this present moment, we will actually see the significance of this later on. Just as an aside, this kind of PSK in which there are only two different states is called binary PSK, because there are just two states, which is of course binary in nature. We actually lay things out like this for a very good reason, and that's because when we actually want to move beyond binary PSK and add in more points, well, this becomes a valuable way for us to actually visualize our different phases. This is a 4-state PSK, called Quadrature PSK. And notice what we've done here. These phases are no longer just 0 and 180 degrees. In fact, there are 45 degrees in each quadrant. Writing out these angles numerically will actually, you know, not be as comprehensive as what we have here. Incidentally, a constellation diagram also helps us in the planning aspect. The reason for this is, we actually want to maximize the angle between each successive phase. The reason why we want to do that, of course, is to make all the different states as different as possible. And this, of course, increases robustness to noise. We'll take another look at constellation diagrams later on, but for now, let's move on once again to our next keying method, namely frequency shift keying. I think this is super straightforward, we just use different frequencies to represent different binary values. All the usual things apply, by using more frequencies, 
By using more distinct frequencies, we can represent more values. And in fact, what you can do is you can mix two or more tones together. And in tandem, they can actually represent different pieces of information. There are two notable examples of this, which actually does this over audio. The first of which is DTMF, also known as Dual Tone Multi Frequency. This is in fact the sound you hear when you actually press buttons on your phone keypad. All the sounds you hear when you press those buttons are in fact two different sine waves mixed together. And when laid out in a grid form, you can see that, well, one frequency actually represents the row, and the other frequency represents the column. Another more complex version of this is used by dial-up modems. Now, if you've been using the internet in that era, you will know all the sounds a modem makes. Now you know what the sound is actually for. By changing up the frequency of the tone that is creating, it is actually encoding changing digital information. Now here's the deal. What we've taken a look at so far has been three different shift keying techniques that answer to the three different properties of sine waves. Each of those techniques we've seen can actually be varied so that it carries more information at a time. But what if we want more? Well, as it turns out, all we have to do is to use a combination of those methods. This is called quadrature amplitude modulation and is usually a mix of amplitude and phase shift keying. This is where a constellation diagram really comes in useful because, well, explaining this in words can be extremely difficult. We have already seen how an angle on a constellation diagram represents phase, and earlier on we've said that we should just put everything on the same circle. Well, in fact, the size of a circle actually has its meaning. The smaller a ring is, the lower the amplitude of the signal. And that is why when we're combining amplitude and phase shift keying, we actually start to make use of the entire area of the graph. Let's look at a very simple example to sort of drill this in. This is what is known as 8QAM, which is of course a quadrature amplitude modulation technique that encodes 8 different distinct states. As you can see, there are two distinct amplitudes, and for each amplitude there are 4 distinct phases. Note of course that the phases are actually different for you know the lower amplitude and the higher amplitude, and that actually adds a layer of redundancy. So there is a significant distinction between the states that are on the inner ring versus the states on the outer ring. Sure, we could set them up with the same phases, but then we will have to be very careful about the amplitude. If there is signal attenuation, we might confuse stuff on the inner ring with stuff on the outer ring. That's why we actually offset the phase, so that that confusion is less likely to come up. Of course, this is one extremely simple example of QAM. What you'll find is that there are much more complex versions available. Now, this is a rectangular version of 16 QAM, and the reason why we call this rectangular is because we no longer actually lock this to rings, we no longer lock this to particular angles. If we were to actually measure some of the phases, for example the phase to this particular state, you will realize that it is some odd angle, and the amplitude is also quite an odd number. Laying things out this way makes it very visually easy to understand, even though on the implementation side we're going to have to actually calculate the actual phases and amplitudes. Now, when we're using a technique like QAM, we can really stick many points on the constellation diagram which allow us to represent many different values at once. In fact, QAM schemes can go from 64 QAM all the way up to something crazy like 4096 QAM. Now, our next example right before we wrap up, will actually show you both, you know, something interesting about QAM as well as something interesting about constellation diagrams. And in fact, this application is known as a video vector scope. You see, when we actually transmit video, we transmit the brightness information and the color information separately. What you're seeing here is a representation of the color information. In particular, the angle refers to the hue, and the actual displacement from the center, the amplitude, actually represents the saturation. So in fact, this particular vector scope 
comes from this particular picture. As you can see, you know, apart from the white background, which should be clustered around the center because it has no saturation, much of the redness and orangeness of my arm will be in sort of these areas. And as you can see, that is indeed what the scope is telling us. Here's a more concrete example. As you can see, there is a ball on screen that is constantly changing color. And what you notice, of course, is that, well, the graph is going round and round. We are essentially only changing the face. What's really cool is that since this graph actually represents all the color information that is appearing on screen at once, well, we can as easily represent two things that are changing color in the scene, and you can actually see two lines appear in the graph. Of course, since both these spheres are actually at full saturation, you see that the line goes all the way to the very edge of the constellation diagram. If I were to lower the saturation of one of the two spheres, now notice that one of the lines actually only go halfway. So yeah, that's just a little bit of insight for you. Just a little extra tidbit of information. QAM can even be used in areas like video transmission. And in fact, just by taking one look at the vector scope, we can get quite a bit of information about the nature of the video. So there you go. Today we've taken a look at four different methods of encoding digital information on an analog medium. That's all there is for today's episode. I hope you've gained some insight today, but until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.